Hi, I'm Pete McCall. Welcome to episode 98 of All About Fitness. This is probably one of the most important episodes I've done to date because I address something that really is overlooked in the fitness industry. And it's something that I know a lot of people have dealt with. And maybe as a listener, you yourself have dealt with it. But that's exercise addiction. And I know at first, you know, when you hear that, you're like, oh, how can, I wish I were addicted to exercise. But in, in all seriousness, this is a huge issue. It gets into body, you know, body acceptance. It gets into body image. It gets into the feeling of never being good enough. I need, you know, for some people it might be, I need to lose weight. I need to be thin. I tell you what, men deal with it too. You know, I've worked at a gym and, and you know, I worked at a gym in a gay neighborhood where it's a huge issue among some of the members. You know, I would see guys in the gym two, three times a day. I was paid to be there and they were coming in to work out trying to, you know, trying to attain some body image issue. So on this episode of All About Fitness, I speak with Katie Schreiber. She's a reporter and a writer who wrote a book, The Truth About Exercise Addiction, Understanding the Dark Side of Inspiration. I'm going to definitely have a link to the book in the show notes so that if you feel this is something you're dealing with, you can get some understanding from it. And the important thing about Katie that we discuss is that this, this work, you know, she considers herself a recovering exercise addict. This work has led her to pursue, she's currently pursuing a master's in social work. So she's now using this to study a little bit more about how she can go out there and help, and, and help other people. After a brief word from the sponsor of All About Fitness, I'll be speaking with Katie Schreiber, the author of The Truth About Exercise Addiction. What is part bench, part balance trainer, part stability ball, part jump box, and all results? The TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, specially designed to help enhance balance, strength, agility, and metabolic conditioning. The TerraCore is quickly becoming the go-to piece of workout equipment used by fitness professionals around the world. Whether you're training to earn that eight-figure contract or just trying to get in better shape, the TerraCore will help you achieve results you never thought possible. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness, the shape of things to come. Go to www.vicorefitness.com and use code AAF, that's all about fitness, AAF, to save 20% on the purchase of a TerraCore. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness. I'm here today with Katie Schreiber, a writer and an author, and we're here to talk about her book and about exercise addiction. Katie, can you give us a little introduction and your, the title of your book and kind of how you got into the topic? Absolutely. So my book is called The Truth About Exercise Addiction, Understanding the Dark Side of Thinspiration. Um, and it's a book about the concept of exercise addiction, what it is, what it looks like, who is affected by it, a uh, brief history of it, uh, as well as the research into it. Um, also personal stories in there from several people who have struggled with the issue, uh, including myself. Um, I actually was inspired to write the book after having written an article about my own experience with exercise addiction. Uh, and how it kind of took over my life for a number of years. And uh, I, the way that I knew to get out of it was to learn about it. And I found that there was not much written about it, especially not for the lay public. It was There were some academic articles and an academic book or two on it, but um, you know, I didn't really find anything out there that was a hybrid of both that the lay person and the medical professional could um, benefit from. So I teamed up with uh, Heather Hausenblas, who's my co-author. She's a psychologist uh, who studies exercise addiction, among other things. Uh, She's at Jacksonville University. And um, we first, she was a a source of mine on an article that I wrote about exercise addiction. And then we decided to write a book together. And then uh, the rest is history. I think that's an important thing. And and, and listeners out there, you might be listening to this and kind of it might have a little bit of a, of a scoff or a little bit of a perplexed attitude because we we're, we understand that exercise is good for us. I mean, we, we kind of think that exercise is good, but how do you quantify, you know, because exercise addiction might seem a little bit out there, but how would you quantify exercise addiction? What, what would you describe as being addicted to exercise? 
Right. Which is a great question. Um, and it, it mirrors the symptoms of any addiction. So you build up a tolerance, you go through withdrawal when you don't do it. Um, you know, you might not go into delirium tremens if you miss a day on the treadmill, <laughs> but you still experience, you know, fatigue, headache, um, extreme irritability, anxiety. Um, those all count. Um, needing more and more of the activity to satisfy yourself, uh, like you were satisfied the first time around. And now, you know, the interesting thing with that exercise addiction is some of these symptoms are normal for exercising. You know, your tolerance does go up, even if you're not addicted, like you can lift heavier weights, you can run longer, your stamina goes up. Like that's good. We want that to happen, but it's that. And so that's like the dependence part of it that, and it starts to encroach on the rest of your life. So you start canceling social plans. You start withdrawing from your hobbies, your other interests. Um, your health is starting to fail instead of making you healthier. Uh, you know, for women, one of the first hallmarks is, you know, you lose your menstrual cycle. Um, uh, men, they don't, I, there's not, um, a comparable measure in men per se. Um, but fatigue, loss of sex drive, um, issues with concentration, issues with sleep. Um, you, maybe you have tried to cut back and you failed to cut back. That's a, that's a big sign. Other people are noticing it's becoming a problem. That's a little complicated because in many circles, sometimes exercise is not, you know, a culturally uh, popular thing, let's say. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you can have people commenting on, oh, you go to the gym too much. And it's like, well, it's not really a problem. It's just that nobody else does it. So that that's tricky. So it's you have to keep in mind it's all of these plus your experience emotionally, physically, psychologically. What's going on? Are you miserable? Are you do you feel like your gym schedule is running your life or do you feel like you're in control of your gym schedule? Rigidity is a big hallmark of it. When you are completely inflexible, you have to do the same thing on this day. And if you compromise at all, or if you have to scale back, you, you, you get angry, you're ang anxious. Um, those are really the, the hallmark signs and, and the way it gets, uh, it interferes with the rest of your life, your work, your, your family, your, um, the overall well-being. Well, and I want to, you know, for listeners, you know, as we go forward, Katie, I want to make clear that, that you're the writer, you're a journalist, and you worked with a psychologist on this. And what are you studying right now? Because you told me that you're in a program now that was that was what you're doing now partly inspired by your work on this book? Oh, definitely. So I'm getting my master's in social work uh, at Fordham University. Um, I, I've always been interested in psychology and mental health, and I didn't know what angle I wanted to go into it from. Uh, social work seemed right to me for a number of reasons, particularly it's um, focus on person and environment and social justice approach. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I was very much galvanized to go into the field and be a clinician, uh, after learning a lot about this issue and also having gone through my own recovery process, my own mental health journey in this with, through exercise addiction. Um, I feel that it's, it's helpful, you know, when you've been the client on the couch to be the therapist on the other side of the couch. And, and that's actually an interesting look at it. And, and I want to, we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a few minutes, but I want to talk a little bit about first about, cause I think a lot of listeners out there can kind of understand this a little bit because there's something we always talk about the runner's high, right? I mean, that's something that we're commonly used to. We used to hear people that are runners. Well, you know, I'm addicted to running because of the runner's high, but, and when we look at this, this is something I've seen firsthand. And now I haven't been a clinician in psychology, but as a personal trainer, and group fitness instructor for almost 20 years, I have seen people who I thought were overly committed to the gym. I would put it this way, mm -hmm. Katie, I would be, I worked in downtown DC and I would train some clients in the morning at one gym, in the business area, and I would have clients or classes in the evening at another gym in the more residential area of the city. They're not that far apart, a couple of miles. We, we know how that works in the city, but I would see people in the gym working out at both locations you know, and I was getting paid to be there. I was there for work. You know, I was there for, yeah. for the job because I'd be training clients. But I would see people exercise at one gym in the morning, and then they had to exercise again in the evening. And I've worked with a few clients who, a few female clients who had amenorrhea, which is a loss of the menstrual cycle. And they, they one, one of them didn't refuse to work with me again because I told her, well, if that's the case, then you probably don't need exercise for a little while, you know, from a physiological mm -hmm. standpoint. So when we look at it physiologically, do you go into that in your book? Do you go into like the neurotransmitters, the hormones? Because you, the way you describe it, it sounds a lot like any other addiction in that we get triggered by certain, certain neurotransmitters. You know, what, what was that or what are those transmitters? 
Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, we go into some of the physiology of it, um, uh, the physiology of going too far, um, and what, you know, hormonal disruption, uh, things like that. I mean, you know, so getting back to your point about the runner's high, yes, we definitely touch on that. And that that's kind of an initial appeal for some people is like the spark of endorphin. Um, and you know, also when you're, when you're exercising, I think you, you do release, um, some endogenous opioids in some respect. Yeah, actually, um, yeah, you do, you do, you totally do. Yeah. Yeah. And that can lower perception of pain naturally. Um, so, you know, you have people going into this activity that releases endorphins, uh, which make you feel wonderful. And also there's adrenaline involved, you know, you're really into it. You're listening to great music. You're just, and, and you, then you have these feelings of empowerment from meeting your goals. You have these endogenous opioids flooding your system. So it, it really is, I mean, contrary to what some people might think who don't exercise, a lot. But exercising can be a very physically and emotionally pleasurable experience uh, that also has a, has a pain numbing effect. There's a lot of research linking exercise to higher pain tolerances. So um, that is one avenue through which people might begin to overuse it is because it makes them feel better because it alleviates pain because then there's also the social aspect and the cultural aspect of, you know, we have this, we kind of fetishize fitness, I feel like. And we have all these, the idea of the fit body is such an alluring prospect. And to think that we might approximate that, uh, through our behavior can drive us to engage in that behavior that leads us to approximate that ideal even more and even more. Well, and I was going to ask that because where were you living when you, when you experienced, when you kind of went through your exercise, exercise addiction, because I think that has a large part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I was born and raised in New York city. Uh, so that has a lot to do with it. It started in New York city. Um, I was in college very close to New York city. Um, and yeah, after college in New York city. So that's, that's, that's huge. And, and it's been, cause it's been my experience in, in, cause the company I used to work for, I would travel between Washington, Philadelphia, and New York teaching workshops. I work for the parent company, New York sports clubs. And it's been my experience that you have cities like, you know, New York, and it, I'm probably going to say it's probably more lower Manhattan than it is would be the upper West side, but the, it's probably the East side, upper East side and lower Manhattan. You have Miami, Dallas and Houston a little bit. And then everything in Southern California below Ventura County, those are the portions of the country where exercise is all about appearance, where exercise is yeah. about extrinsic appearance. So how much motivation do you think or how much does that tie into this addiction experience, this exercise addiction experience is trying to achieve some sort of media driven image? Is that a huge component of it? It can be for some people. You mentioned an important word there, extrinsic. So there's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Um, intrinsic is you're doing it because you love it. Extrinsic is you're doing it to achieve some goal that's outside of yourself. And that could be social approval. It could be money. It could be uh, earning your vacation day, whatever the heck it is. You know, there's a lot. But I think that for a lot of people and, I, and you know, I, I don't I don't want to definitively say that women ha are more extrinsically motivated to go to the gym than men are. Um, there's different studies that have different results. Um, you know, I think that women are more motivated by the thin ideal and men are more motivated by the fit ideal, uh, which are extrinsic rewards in and of themselves. But, you know, I think that a lot of, especially in the, in the major cities and the areas where such emphasis is placed on um, how you look, that is a huge factor for people to get to the gym. Unfortunately, it's for the for the majority of people who are motivated to go to the gym just to achieve a certain uh, physique or appearance. It's not sustainable. Uh, that's kind of the New Year's resolution crop, right? Who's yeah. in the gym right now as we speak, and in a couple months they'll be back to doing what they were doing um, because it's it's not intrinsically rewarding, which means you don't want to do it. Um, after a certain time you get bored of it. Um, so yes, it's a huge factor. It's also a big factor for people who do struggle with body dysmorphia, um, and, and issues related to poor body image, um, that will compel them to keep going. And they were more likely to exercise in an unhealthy manner because they're not listening to their body. If you're specifically pursuing an external reward, reward, you're alienating yourself from what your body actually wants and needs and feels. And, and the interesting thing, and, and Katie, when I worked in D.C., one of the gyms I worked in was in a, a predominantly gay neighborhood. And so, and, and the members there 
were, you know, obviously, you know, majority gay men. And I saw a lot of that. You know, you talk, you want to talk about, you know, body image issues. And this isn't something that's mentioned much in, you know, and I don't even know if it's studied much in academic circles, but just anecdotally, having been in gyms in South Beach, having been in gyms in West Hollywood, and having been in gym, you know, worked in a gym in DuPont Circle and in DC, there is a huge, huge issue with body dysmorphia among gay men because they're always yeah. trying to, you know, achieve this perfect ideal. Now let's talk a little bit about thin spiration. What is what is thin spiration? So I think it because this is an issue, and that's why I wanted to speak with you. It affects both genders. I don't think it's it's. I think each gender is driven to it a little bit differently. But I would argue that each you know that both genders are affected by exercise addiction. It does have you know devastating effects on our life. Let's talk a little bit about this thin spiration culture. How would you identify that, and and how does that impact this this whole issue of exercise addiction? Yeah, so I think there's two things here. One, inspiration and fitspiration. Um, at the time of my book, the concept of fitspiration was not as popular. So unfortunately, I couldn't put on the title. Uh, <laughs> I wanted it to be the truth about fitspiration, but the truth, you know, the dark side of fitspiration. But my editor, you know, yeah, I had a different idea, but that's okay. So there's thin inspiration. It really dates back to kind of this pro anorexia movement that mm-hmm. that happened in you know the 80s, the 90s, uh, very fueled by online images of uh, you know painfully thin models uh, and other people uh, used as motivation to not eat. This is for people who struggled with eating disorders. Um, so that was kind of like the subculture of Thinspiration. And then you have the popular Thinspiration, thin which is people on the cover of magazines who are very thin and in swimsuits saying, well, I lost 100 pounds or shed your baby weight. And it was mostly targeted towards women. But you do see it increasingly targeted towards men. If you look at the covers of, you know, men's fitness, muscle and fitness, you know, all these people who'd have very little body fat. Um, and then kind of thin fitspiration starts to come in, in the two thousands, uh, when, when gym culture is getting more popular, when fitness is becoming more and more of a thing that people want to say they do. And, and we're learning the benefits of it and we're all freaked out about the obesity epidemic. Um, so fitspiration is a, is a, cousin, I would say, of Thinspiration, uh, but but it's not focused on losing weight for the purposes of being rail thin or being the thinnest one in the room. It, it, Fitspiration is more focused on strength building, uh, ha- being lean, but being muscular, being toned. Uh, so it's, it's a similar version, and research actually finds that Fitspiration is less detrimental to your psyche than Thinspiration. Fitspiration, it, it can motivate you to go to the gym, but it motivates you to be, to, to work towards strengthening yourself, not just depleting yourself so that you're, you know, you can fit into a size zero. And, and both men and women are, are affected well, by it. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the, the physiology of it. And I was just looking up because it, it's interesting. You talk a little bit about the culture. I, I, I don't know if you've run across um, Natalia Petrozella. She's a actually a professor at the new, the new school in, uh, in Manhattan. But I'm going to have to connect you after this because Natalia is actually working on a history. She's a professor of history and she's working on a history of the fitness industry because I think oh, wow. that I think that's been because when you look at it, the fitness industry became popular. We had the first fitness boom in the 70s, Katie, when you had the Cooper Clinic come out and promote you know aerobic exercise. You had jazzercise. Right. People started coming to, you know, you had Jane Fonda. People started promoting that. And then the 80s. What was the big driver? What was the big driver of fitness in the eighties? Do you think? I just I was interested in your reaction. I don't know if you if you remember the eighties, and I'm not trying to, but <laughs> um, I, because you, I might be a couple of years older than you. But what do you think was the big fitness driver in the eighties? That's a good question. I mean, I came uh, into this world late into in the eighties. Okay, uh, that's what I was wondering. But but it, 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 but but I could tell you it, this is you know you have that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger was huge. You know he, you know oh, yeah. Terminator came out in like nineteen eighty three or eighty four. You had the Rocky. Okay. You had Rocky Balboa. You know Rocky three, Rocky four. Um, you know when he fought Dolph Lundgren, and and so in the eighties all of a sudden all your movie stars go back if you if you will watch a movie from the sixties or seventies. And then watching movies in the, from the 80s or 90s, and, and it's like you're seeing two different types of male lead. And you're probably seeing two different That's types of female lead because in the 60s or 70s, you know, you had Steve McQueen. I'm thinking of the, the movie Bullet. You had um, Paul Newman. These guys were relatively lean. You know, they weren't unfit, but they were relatively just average size. All of a sudden, the 80s, you get Schwarzenegger, you get Van Damme, you get Stallone. 
And that kind of drove, in my opinion, that kind of drove this whole fitness culture of people trying to attain this. Do you think, do you think media, do you think that extrinsic motivation of what the media tries to tell us we should look like, do you think that has a huge impact on, um, on this issue? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we get so much of the idea of who we should be from media, from newspapers, magazines, what's on TV, what's in the movies, uh, what we hear about. And to, to view these people, even though people probably didn't aspire themselves uh, consciously to be the, ter- the Terminator or Arnold Schwarzenegger, just the fact that there's more and more images of fit and toned and thin bodies out there, it influences us. And then the appeal and the allure of these people, how they're uh, kind of worshipped by, by our culture, um, you know, that shifts the focus to saying, okay, well, this is what you should look like. Even if nobody's saying explicitly, oh, you should look exactly like Arnold Schwarzenegger or, uh, you know, some other person who is beautiful and fit on the cover of a fitness magazine, those images are pervasive and they get into our unconscious and they, and they drive us to a certain extent. And we compare ourselves to them, whether we, whether we're aware of it or not. Well, there's been a big issue on, you know, on that note, there's been a big issue in the bodybuilding community with depression and with suicide among you yeah. know, top bodybuilders that once, both male and female, that once they kind of lose their ability to maintain a certain muscularity, it, it, it sends them spiraling downhill, you know, and, and I'm not going to say that exogenous androgens, you know, what we commonly call steroids, have anything to do with it. I think it's much more of a social acceptance issue. And on this note, you know, and then get back to the exercise addiction, I think you're absolutely right. I think we started seeing different images in the media from the mid eighties on in terms of what we expect men and women to look like. And I think, you know, having grown up as a teenager being in high, in high school in the eighties, that is what got me interested in the exercise in the first place. I'll be, you know, hundred percent, you know, that, Hey, I want to look like that. I want to look like, you know, Schwarzenegger, the way I frame it is they always kick butt and got the girl, <laughs> you know, who wouldn't want to, right. uh, you know, who wouldn't want to, um, who wouldn't want to look like that. And, and it really, I think that that drives the issue um, that, that drives the issue. So in your experience, is it easy to, to treat, um, exercise addiction? Well, do you mind talking about your experience a little bit? Like how did you come about in, in identifying it? And then once you identified it, what was your step in kind of addressing it? Absolutely. So to first address, is it, is it, you know, how, how do you treat it or is it easy? Is it hard? It's very tricky to treat because first and foremost, you know, exercise addiction is not codified in the diagnostic and statistic manual of mental disorders. It's under the rubric of behavioral addictions, which some psychologists, yeah, yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not an actual code that you can bill your insurance for, um, in, in large part because research is still ongoing into it. However, ask anybody who's gone overboard and exercise and they'll say, no, it's definitely legit. <laughs> like I've, yeah. I've struggled with it. So it's very tricky to address excessive exercise, um, because you don't want to encourage a client to stop exercising. That's the worst. That's like the worst thing you can do. You have to develop a moderate approach to it, which is very difficult. It's like telling an alcoholic, well, just have a couple, you know, you can do it. And, and, and there, there are some movements where the, there's a push for moderation, but you know, there are people who genetically, uh, they're, they're just, they, they can't, they can't do They can't drink moderately. They have one and they have to have seven plus. Um, so the tricky thing with exercise addiction is it's not like the way you trick, you treat other addictions. You cannot, you, you shouldn't treat it with total abstinence. You, you can, but that's just as unhealthy. So, um, you know, oftentimes it's tricky because exercise addiction, there's this primary and secondary and Primary exercise addiction is when you're um, addicted to the activity in and of itself, and you're not so much doing it uh, just to be thin um, or to control how much you eat. Secondary exercise addiction is when it's basically part of an eating disorder. Uh, exercise can be an alternative form of purging for people. So you have bu- exercise bulimia, it's, it's also called. Um, and so that in that case, you know, you have to treat the eating disorder and the excessive exercise. In the case of just the, I'm purely addicted to the exercise for the sake of exercise, you have to learn how to moderate your behavior again. And, and some approaches whether that's pharmaceutical approaches um, to calm down the underlying, sometimes there's an underlying pathology, um, possibly a a manic depression, uh, bipolar, um, some kind of personality disorder, um, 
you know, then there's also just approaches like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, to change the cognitions you have about the activity uh, so that you don't go excessively into it as much. Um, And again, depending on what else you're contending with, like if you're really miserable, if you're suicidal, if you're, if you're really hurting yourself often through exercise, there's, there's other levels. There's dialectical behavior therapy, which is a phenomenal therapy created by Marsha Linehan uh, that's founded on mindfulness um, and and emotion regulation, uh, and also interpersonal skills. Uh, and that is very helpful in, in just grounding people who are, you know, it's very frequently used with a borderline personality disorder, um, patients that can be helpful for, for extreme, uh, behavioral addictions. In my case, I mean, I went, I, I, I first started getting treatment, I would say, let's in, you know, in high school when I, I, I had an, people always knew I had an eating disorder. So my, my exercises, I've experienced both parts. Uh, and I, and I don't know how, how common that is. Um, again, the research is, is very new in this regard. Um, uh, but for, I went back and forth between both. Um, so I had an eating disorder for a while, which that's easily identifiable. I, I got treatment for that. Um, and I would, you know, eat, fine, but I would just be at the gym then constantly. And, and at the time it's different today, but at the time, uh, this is in the, you know, two thousands, early two thousands, uh, there was really no approach to treating exercise addiction in these programs. In fact, you would go and you wouldn't be allowed to exercise at all. And so you miss the opportunity to learn how to exercise in a healthy and more mindful manner. Um, you know, I, I went through all sorts of different therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. I did that for a while. That was helpful. Um, I did, you know, I did this, I saw this therapist, um, and the method they used on me was transference focused psychotherapy. And, and that's not like studied in exercise addiction, but it was very helpful for me, uh, for the amount of time I was in it to just get to the bottom of some of the underlying emotional issues I was having that was fueling my addictive tendencies at the gym. Um, but, but to be quite honest with you, I really, the thing that did the trick for me was one, I think just getting older. I mean, (laughs) you, you, after a while, you, (laughs) not to be very cynical and I'm not that old, but, um, you, you don't care as much as, as you get older, you know, you, other things come up in your life and, uh, you know, you can't do as much. Um, but, but really, honestly, I think the thing that really did it for me, Pete was getting involved, forcing myself to get involved in other things that forced me not to go to the gym all the time. So volunteering, um, going back to school, Mm. um, taking on more meaningful work, uh, writing the book was huge for me. I was just going to ask how therapeutic, how therapeutic was the process uh, of working with your writing partner and going through the process of putting this book together? I mean, did did you feel that was extremely helpful in terms of getting a better understanding of what, what was driving this? Definitely. I mean, I, I, I both learned about what was going on with me and I learned about it as it affected other people. I connected. I mean, one of the greatest things about writing this book is I've connected with so many people who struggle with the same thing. So a lot of people struggling with this feel very alone because they feel like nobody understands them. Um, cause if you say, Oh, I have a problem with going to the gym too much. People either laugh at you or say, Oh, I wish I had that. I mean, it's not You're absolutely right. That, that, that's, that's exactly the two answers. And just to, in my experience, and this is why I, I really I'm enjoying this conversation, because having worked, you know, in my I, I got started in personal training in my later 20s, but having worked in downtown D.C., I can't tell you between the gay community and between young women like yourself, how many people that I worked with that that I saw in the gym six, seven days a week. And mm-hmm. it, it kind of went beyond it went beyond being healthy, you know, being a healthy habit and staying fit and being in shape. And actually, for the last number of years, I've been talking about the the the, the effects of overtraining, the physiological effects of overtraining. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a lot more the psychological. So I'm not going to spend as much time on that in this conversation. But in the, I'm just saying this for the sh- for people listening. Uh, from in my conclusion, I'll talk a little bit about the physiological effects of overtraining because ec- too much exercise will shut down various physiological systems in the body. It'll change your whole hormonal profile. It'll change how your body produces certain hormones. So I'll talk about that a little bit more after the show. But what you're talking about, it, you know, it, it, you don't know this. We haven't talked much, you know, other than one or two media interviews. But I'm a 12 stepper. You know, I've been I've been you know dealing with alcohol, you know, alcohol addiction for a number of years. 
you know, and, and, you know, been in and out of recovery in various phases. And so this juxtaposes very well with kind of my experience, because one of the things that works really well is when you're, you are going to AA meetings and you're communicating with other people. And that's kind of what you're just talking about, you know, and, and you have this whole support group and you realize that you're not alone and that you realize that you need to get out of yourself If that makes sense, because when you're in your addiction, you're focused on your needs. You're focused on that that next high. You're focused on, you know, on just making yourself feel better through whatever that issue is. And and no, I mean, I'm one of these people that I haven't had a drink for years because I know if I have one drink, (laughs) I can end up I can end up in in Las Vegas with my pants on my head. You know, I don't I don't know where it's going to take me. So um, it's better off if I don't take that first drink. And, and, you know, it just it's been, you know, it's been a big issue. And and I feel like this is an issue that has we've barely scratched the surface. I think your book is kind of touching upon that surface because I think a lot of people would look at this and kind of go, oh, yeah, right, exercise addiction. And you're right. I wish I was addicted. But living here in Southern California, Katie, I can't tell you the number of people I see who push other things out of the way to get their workout in. So that's why mm-hmm. I want to you know, have this conversation because it is something that we at least need to start having a conversation about in the fitness community. And it's not that you know all exercise is bad, but it's putting other things in your life aside so you can make it to the gym. So now, you know, now having gone through this, what's your, what's your approach? I mean, what's your relationship with exercise now? Well, I still do something physical, um, pretty much every day. I don't do what I used to do, which is constant cardio all the time. And then an hour of weight training. And then I go back later on my lunch break and then I go back, you know, I switch it up and I, and I, for the first time I'm like listening to my body. Um, I, if I'm tired, I will do a lighter cardio session, lighter weights, yoga. Um, I, you know, I have my routines that I stick to. I do, I kind of alternate. So I'll do, um, you know, more cardio on one day and then the next day I'll do, you know, lower body. And then the next day I'll do, um, light cardio or yoga. And then the next day I'll do upper body. So, you know, I do still do it. I think what's interesting is I, I, I'm still fascinated and I'll be completely honest with the line between passion and pathology, because someone might look at me today and say, well, you still go to the gym pretty much every day. Like, wouldn't you say you're still addicted? And I would say, fair point. I'm probably like on the border, but I, you know, to be, I hope this isn't TMI, you know, I'm regularly menstruating like that. And that's like, for me, that's the hallmark. I'm like, if that ever is messed up, then I have to scale it back or I have to change what I'm eating. Um, I'm able to enjoy a social life. Uh, I get enough sleep. I'm able to handle a full course load at school. Um, I'm doing an internship and I'm also juggling three part-time jobs. So, you know, like this. <laughs> oh, you got nothing going I mean, on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I'm total loser. I just like sit at home all day. <laughs> but, but the, the part um, about the part yeah. about menstruation though, and that, I'll talk, like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about overtraining after the show, but for women listening, that's one of the first markers of physiological overtraining is it changes your it, it changes the normal cycle of how your body produces hormones. I mean, I worked with one client who hadn't had a who hadn't had a, a period in like 5 or 6 months because she was working out 60 to 90 minutes a day. And that really just and what cuz the other thing too, you brought up you brought up the eating issue because mm-hmm. you know when we look at exercise, exercise is energy expenditure. We need energy intake. We need carbohydrates, we need fats, we need proteins. And so one of the things that happens, Katie, is that people that, that get addicted to that feeling of exercise and that this whole thin inspiration, I need to be thin, they'll start cutting their calories, right? And, and so right. If, if they're cutting their calories and, and only on an 800 to 1,000 calorie a day diet, yet they're doing you know, a, a 1,500 calorie a day workout, now all of a sudden they're not going to be burning fat, they're going to be burning muscle. That's part of the physiology of it is your body is going to be burning amino acids. And another telltale marker of that is if you ever have your clothes, if you ever have your sweaty clothes, you know how you put them in a gym bag sometimes, you, you put them in that plastic bag and you get them home, you get them out to wash and they smell like ammonia. That, that's, an oh. indica- yeah, that's an indication that you've been burning amino acids, that your body's been metabolizing wow. amino acids for fuel. So if you, for people wow. listening, if you ever pull your, your sweaty clothes out of a gym bag and you're like, why does it smell like ammonia? That's because your body was, it's called gluconeogenesis. Your body's been metabolizing, um, been metabolizing amino acids for fuel instead of carbohydrate or fat because you simply just don't have enough available carbohydrate or fat for energy. 
And if you're doing that, then you're not building muscle. You know, protein is meant to repair tissue. Protein is not meant to be a fuel source. If it's being used in fuel, that's an extremely dire situation. And then then we'll come back. But it's interesting that you say your your program now, you know, cardio one day, maybe strength training one day and yoga one day, because having just, I interviewed a guy named Dr. Andy Galpin, who's a, um, he's a professor of kinesiology in uh, Cal State Fullerton. And we were talking about that type of program. That's the type of program he recommends to people. That's the type of program I've recommended to people for a while is strength training one day, some sort of energy system, cardio another day, and then some sort of body weight, just full body movement a third day. And, you know, to looking into this into the future, do you think there's something that gyms or the fitness industry could be doing to address this? And if so, what would that be? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I do think that gyms should be educating their clients more. I mean, I know a lot of gyms have an introductory personal training session, um, but they don't really do much in my experience to explain to you why you need to take a rest day. Um, I, I think that gyms could do a much, they could, they, I think they could benefit clients more by, by including more information just at it in the gym itself, like posters on the reasons that you need to rest or how to, uh, take your heart rate, which I've seen that before, but it seems like I don't see that as much anymore. I mean, I go to New York sports club, um, and I, and they're fine, you know, they're great. Um, there's a lot of locations They're They're convenient. Um, I've been to Equinox now I've been to the small like boutique gyms in, in the city, but I think having more information readily available and also, you know, having a consultation with, a with a personal trainer, um, and a recommendation for referral to a nutritionist or physical therapist if necessary, uh, would be helpful. Um, I think it's also very important for, um, primary, uh, care physicians to be screening for not just the level of physical activities, but somebody's, uh, psychological approach to, to fitness, uh, and whether they might need a referral and whether they might need Hmm. further education. Um, but yes, I think that gyms can do better in terms of just educating their clients more. And, and, and also, you know, yeah, go ahead. No, I was to say that that's because having man, you know, I managed a, a health club um, in my in my late 20s. I just spent about two years in management. And there were a few times when other members would approach me about a member who maybe I don't want to diagnose anybody. I don't have the qualifications to diagnose, diagnose anybody, but a member might approach me. And this happened maybe half a dozen times. In my, in my time in management, where um, one, one member would approach me about another member being concerned that that member was way too thin, that that member mm. was underweight, member, anorexic. And as a, as a health club operator, I can't come to you. I couldn't come to you and say, Katie, you know, I think you're too thin. I don't, I'm not going to let you be a member here because now I'm mm-hmm. discriminating against you because it is in, it's, what, the DSM, the, the, diagnostic, the, the diagnostic, cause, diagnostic, because if I discriminate against somebody, if I say you can't join this gym, because you might have this, I perceive that you have this this mental issue. Mm-hmm. Now that opens the health club up for a whole you know liability discrimination lawsuit. You know, on the other hand, a lot of the, a lot of the staff members just aren't trained on how to identify and how to address this. So I think this is a number one. It's a serious issue. I really I really believe that. I really do believe it's a serious issue. Having worked in commercial gyms for as long as I have. Number two, it's a multifaceted approach of where we do need – that's why I want to do this podcast to start raising that awareness. We do need to start talking about it from a standpoint of, hey, how do we address this? Because is it your primary care? If your primary care notices that that you have a menorrhea and you haven't had, you know – um, a, a menstrual cycle for a number of months. You know, is it you know psychology? Is it nutrition? I, I honestly don't know the answer. I just at least want to start initiating the conversation. Now, how has this book been received? When when as how has it been? You know, you have a few really good reviews on Amazon, but have you done a book tour? Have you gone out and spoken about it? What's the reception um, from your from this from this book? Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't done a formal book tour, um, but I have given talks and I had a book release um, uh, at a bookstore here in New York. Um, I've also continued to write about it and, and excerpt it in, in different places and, and do media interviews. Um, you know, it, it's funny because it, the interest in it comes in waves. It came out in 2015, uh, and initially when it came out, there was a lot of interest. Um, of course, there's always going to be people, oh, this isn't a real thing, this is ridiculous. Um, but there was a huge wave of interest um, over the the last summer, 
Um, it kind of blew up uh, in part because, well, actually in large part because um, my uh, my co-author and I and another um, psychologist, um, we are authored a paper in the British Medical Journal on exercise addiction, uh, a pointer for physicians to uh, identify it and questions they can ask, talking about your primary care physician, uh, questions they can ask to, to assess for it uh, in a sense. And um, you know, that got picked up by the media and people took an interest in it again. It's funny because I, I see, I've seen now a cycle where like every year they, you know, people get really interested in it and then they forget about it and then they discover it again. And I think that it's more in the public conscious now. Um, the reception of it has mostly been, that's really interesting. I think I know someone who has that. Yeah. Um, I, or, I can it, see I, that. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, there's always going to be people who deny it uh, or don't want to like see it as a, as a real thing. But, um, for, for the most part, it's been, yeah, you're right. Like that, that is a thing. I'm glad you're, somebody's finally talking about it. Well, it's kind of like sex addiction, right? Or sexual addiction mm -hmm. is that for years it was kind of like, you know, kind of a ha ha ha, you don't have it. Then all of a sudden we had a few high profile celebrities who, you know, claimed that disorder. There's that TV show or there's, a, I think, a show on HBO or Showtime or something that kind of dealt with it. And now it's being much more, I guess, it's much more in the forefront, especially with the Me Too movement. There's been a much more of awareness of it. And, and I don't know if we're going to need to have that that awareness, you know, in order to get people more kind of just aware, <laughs> kind of redundant there. Yeah. You know, we, we need more awareness to get people more aware. Um, but when you look at this, because when you started writing this book, I just think this whole fitspiration culture was starting to evolve. And how has, because yeah. I think that's been a big change, and we'll, we'll start wrapping up the conversation with this. I think that's been a very positive change in fitness where you see strong as the new sexy, where you see mm -hmm. people. I just interviewed a, 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 an Instagram person named Lita Lewis. Lita has half a million followers, Katie, and she, her thing is thick thighs save lives. She's doing fitness yeah. and body acceptance for full-figured women, and some of the top Instagram fitness people are that way. Do you think that's mm -hmm. kind of, Do you think that means that people are starting to recognize that we don't need to be thin to be fit? Absolutely. I think that's a huge change over the past several years, especially thanks to the body positivity movement. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, fitspiration and thinspiration are, are, are slightly different and they have different effects. Fitspiration, while it can be used to um, motivate somebody to, to hurt themselves, you know, and over, overdo it, it's less likely uh, to do so than, than thinsp thinspiration. Uh, so we're, we're all looking, you know, the, the new ideal is, is the fit ideal. And because of the body positivity movement, the fit ideal is not just super lean, super muscular. Um, it's also strong, um, but not necessarily uh, rail thin or, you know, 2% body fat. Um, we see, we see, we're just like, you know, when in the eighties we had Arnold Schwarzenegger flexing his muscles and getting all the girls. Now we're, we're seeing more images in the media of women and men, um, who aren't necessarily, um, the fit ideal of the nineties or the early two thousands doing tremendous feats and getting attention and having all these followers. And I think it's wonderful. Uh, and we're, we're starting to recognize that there are more ideals than just the thin ideal, uh, and just the, the lean physique that the that a physique that even has a few more pounds on it can still do incredible things and is just as beautiful. Well, and the interesting thing is there, there have been these large studies that look at, at large populations. They look at uh, morbidity and all cause, all cause morbidity. And there's, there's evidence to show that people that have a slightly higher body mass index live longer than people that have yes. underweight. Have you seen the same? Did you guys, uh, do you talk about that at all in, in the book? No, I think that study that you're mentioning, um, it came out after the book and, and I, because we, you know, we wrote the book in, in, in 2014 was when I, I filed it. Um, yeah. uh, but yeah, no, you're right that there, there has been more research finding that, um, there's an interesting, uh, book. I forget the author's name, but it's called the obese, the myth of obesity or something like that. And he gets into that a lot. Um, yeah. I mean, and there's evidence that people who are underweight are at just as much, if not a greater risk than people who are severely overweight. So that's another thing too. We, we, we haven't really heard much about, but it's true. And that's where, you know, and as somebody who's a, who's been doing fitness education and, and been involved in media now for, for, I mean, I've been doing fitness for 20 years, but I've been doing media as a spokesperson for the American council on exercise for about 10 years now. One of the things I do on purpose, and I, and I mean this on purpose, I, I don't care about having a six pack. 
You know, my focus is on helping people be strong. My focus on my idea of fitness is having the physical ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And I think, you know, that's the one message, that's one of the messages I'm trying to get out with this podcast is fitness is about performance. And that's what Lita and I talked about in our interview is fitness is more about ability. Fitness is about, you know, kind of comfort within your own body. Has, have you cha- has that been a part of changing your mindset is kind of re- reformatting fitness away from the way you look and more towards maybe kind of becoming more, I don't want to say performance-based because you're not competing in any sports, but more of just like, I feel good today. This is what my body wants today. Absolutely. Um, it's funny when you were talking about a six pack, when I had a six pack, I was the weakest I've ever been in my life because I was so malnourished and I was so over exercised and stressed out. It was awful. Since I have said goodbye to my six pack, I'm not only happier, but I feel stronger. I can lift more. I can squat more. I can run faster. Um, I, I just genuinely, genuinely feel like I have more energy. Yes. I think a huge part of my kind of getting out of the exercise addicted mindset is that I'm not doing it to burn a certain amount of calories or achieve a certain weight goal. I'm doing it because it feels great. And also I want to be stronger. I want to be fit. I want to help my back. I want to, you know, live into old age and be able to carry lots of things and go up flights of stairs. And so that's the goal. And it, and it feels so much less stressful and burdensome when I exercise now. Well, here, here's a little secret for you. Uh, buy a minivan and live in the suburbs because then all that stuff, all the, like the, the appearance goal. Yeah. I joke about that quite a bit. You know, I, I have two young kids and it really is. I can't tell you what a, cause I remember in my early twenties, I was that guy. I would blow off, you know, office when I worked in Washington, DC, I worked in politics before I got into fitness, mm. but I wouldn't go to the happy hour. I'd go to the gym instead of going to the happy hour. And anytime I went out, you know, I wouldn't go, wouldn't go out until after I got the workout in. You know, I was also mm-hmm. playing rugby. I was also trying to maintain fitness for rugby, but I didn't, mm. you know, I didn't blow off a lot of things, but fitness was a huge part of my life, you know, because mm-hmm. I liked the way it made me feel. I might be hung over. That was when I was drinking a lot. <laughs> I might've been hung mm-hmm. over. I still would have gone to the gym, you know, and just felt miserable doing that. But now it's so refreshing to focus on movement for the way, you know, for the way we feel. So if people out Mm -hmm. there are listening to this, it really is, it's kind of taking a step back and saying, why, why are you exercising? Is it for, is it to, to try to achieve an appearance? Because I think this is so powerful, Katie. I think this whole strong is beautiful and, and, you know, strong, you know, this whole idea of body positivity is, is, I think it's the right message which is what I want to try to amplify, you know, amplify with this podcast. What, what do you think, how do you think we could help shape that message? I mean, obviously you're writing about it as, as a journalist, but what other things can we do to kind of help create this new awareness and this new body acceptance? Well, I think in, in, in your personal life, you can encourage it among your friends and family. You know, it, it's all about the conversations. If, if you know, don't, don't necessarily focus on, oh, what you hate about your body or what somebody doesn't like about their appearance. Uh, focus on, on an ability they have or something they want to do and want to achieve, uh, something they can do, uh, something that's impressive. Uh, you know, it's, it depends on your professional role, too. But I think, you know, it, at personal trainers, again, the same thing should focus focus less on, oh, you know, work with me because you can shed all this weight to get your bikini body. Um, Instead of that, let's focus on work with me because I can teach you how to be strong and healthy uh, and experience your body in a way you didn't know was possible. Um, I mean, that's really appealing to me. Um, And I think, again, just shifting the focus away from appearance to performance in our personal and if we can professional, if you're a teacher, encouraging, you know, your students, whether you're a professor at college or a teacher at elementary school, uh, to focus less on appearance and more on uh, the physical ability and health of your body. Um, That's that's a huge thing. Well, I think one of them, one of it, too, is you you highlighted this as being essential for for your and I'll call it recovery. Um, and that is don't use exercise to punish yourself. I was just mm-hmm. interviewing a, a strength coach, a youth strength coach, and one of the challenges, one of the things that turns people off from exercise is if a coach punishes a team by having the team run sprints because people mm-hmm. see exercise as a punishment. Did you ever do that? Right. Did you ever use exercise to punish yourself for something you may have eaten or something? And, and how, why is that in such a negative cycle? 
Oh my gosh. I used to do that all the time. And it's a negative cycle because first of all, you start, like you said, you start to associate exercise with suffering. It's why actually some forms of fitspiration and thinspiration really backfire among people who don't want to go to the gym because you think, Oh, I'll, all pain, no gain. You need pain. Suffering is acceptable. Puking is acceptable, but giving up is not acceptable. All those, that, that kind of, those slogans that turns everybody off from exercise. Who's not already addicted to exercise. You know, like yeah. that's, that's, that's hard to motivate, you know, your average person. Um, but, it, but it, doing that creates a cycle, you know, it's, it's like a binge and purge cycle in oh, a way too. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you push yourself at the gym to compensate because God forbid you had a piece of cake. Um, and then you push yourself at the gym so hard that you think, well, now I can have another piece of cake. And then you have another piece of cake and then you go back to the gym. And it's like this whole, you know, not only do you divorce yourself from, from the needs and wants of your body, um, you lose, you associate exercise with misery. You, you fill up your time so much with guilt and obligation and, and you're, you just, I mean, it's a recipe for mental disaster. Um, it's it's awful. So well, it, that's the cycle that happens. You're compounding. You're compounding. Yeah, negative negative association on top of negative association, and it really is. You know, one of the things I would do sometimes with my clients, and you're not going to be able to see this, but I would kind of give people the absolution. You, know, I would do the sign of the cross uh-huh. and say, I, and I would tell people, I don't care what you did or didn't do yesterday. You're here today. You're here today. Mm-hmm. So let's focus on making today healthy as possible. And that was always my focus as a trainer. I never really was that weight loss trainer. I wasn't that trainer that you went to because you wanted to be, you know, do half naked shots of yourself. I was that guy that you went to <laughs> because you wanted to feel better. You wanted to move better. And you wanted, you know, you want to wake up and get out of bed without your back, <laughs> you know, without your back creaking. Exactly. And, and so yeah. next steps, are you working on any, you know, do you have any, are you working on a follow-up for this? Um, you're doing your MSW work, but how are you going to be, what are you doing to kind of help move this conversation? And I, I don't mean to throw, I'm not throwing that at you to like say, what are you doing next to help? But in terms right. of like, in terms of just professional, you know, with the, with your your work towards an MSW, is this going to play a role in that? Are you, is that one of the reasons that, that kind of prompt you on that, that education journey? Definitely. I mean, I hope to work with people who struggle with this one day. Um, at the moment, I'm continuing to write about exercise addiction. I'm continuing to talk about it. Uh, I'm continuing to stay abreast of the research on it. Um, at the at the moment, I am not working on another book because I mentioned my schedule right now. It's a little crazy. <laughs> I would say, yeah, what time? Yeah, but yeah, but that, that time between 1 and 2.30 in the morning looks a little empty, Katie. I exactly. <laughs> And I should really like stop slacking and fill that slot. Um, but, uh, you know, continuing to talk about it, continuing to learn about it. Um, yes, I hope one day to be able to deal with people, uh, who have this and, you know, I, I haven't ruled out, um, even getting my personal training certification one day and, and, and working hands-on with people who have this issue, because I think so many personal trainers, um, are not aware that this is an issue and don't know that they can be a real force in helping someone overcome this. So you have to learn physically what it feels like to, to, engage in moderate activity. That was a challenge for me. It was so hard. And it was almost an experience of exposure therapy where I just had to get used to not doing as much. And I had to get used to listening to my body. And I had to even learn how to do that to begin with. And I learned it over time. It was excruciating, but I would love to be someone who can be both a clinician uh, trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, other um, modalities, and a personal trainer who can help someone, you know, fit both from a psychological and physical standpoint, get to better, better health. I am certified as a yoga teacher. Um, so, you know, that might be another approach, but we will see how this will all come together in about two years when I get my degree. <laughs> well, hey, what I want to do, Katie, is I'll follow up. I mean, I still work closely with the American Council on Exercise. I, I do a lot of content creation for them and, and, and still work with them as a consultant. So uh, we'll talk a little bit offline because I think I could definitely... Um, point you in the right direction in that area because again this is an area where i think we need to address or we we need to raise the awareness of it within our within within the industry do you have a website or a blog or any way that people you know people that might be more interested in reading some of your articles um how they could kind of follow you or or learn more about this issue 
Absolutely. So my website is ktschreib.com. It's K-T-S-C-H-R-E-I-B.com. I'm also at K-T-S-C-H-R-E-I-B on Twitter. Uh, and if you just Google um, my full name, Katherine Schreiber Psychology Today, I have a blog uh, where I write about exercise addiction uh, and uh, amongst many other topics. And um, I also have a blog about exercise addiction and behavioral addiction on um uh, rehabs.com. So if you just Google uh, Catherine Schreiber exercise addiction, you'll probably find it. <laughs> and, and I'll have a link in, in the book is the truth about exercise addiction. Uh, Katie, I'm going to have a link to all your information down below in the show notes, because I really, I, I am truly inspired by the work that you're doing. I think it's really Thank important. You. And I think it's, it's a time that, that as an industry, we start acknowledging this and we start amplifying it a little bit so we can help people move towards a healthy, positive relationship with exercise and fitness. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully you understand why that's such an important issue. It's such an important topic. I mean, as as Katie said, a lot of people, when they hear about that, you know, oh, you're addicted to exercise. Ha, ha, ha. I wish I had that problem. But seriously, it is a serious issue. I don't know how many of you have ever looked around and realized that your schedule is dictated about exercise, that you did or didn't do certain things because you you were afraid or you you didn't you're worried about how it affect your body or how it affect your exercise program. I mean, in all seriousness, I I can't tell you how many people I've, I've known, either worked with or you know just seen that may you know qualify for this. I mean, people become. Here's the thing, guys. Our body likes our, our body likes what makes us feel good. You know, we like the chemicals. You know, serotonin and dopamine. Those are our feel good neurotransmitters. We like epinephrine, norepinephrine, what we commonly call adrenaline. Exercise provides all those things. Exercise makes us feel good. You know, you hear about the endorphins. You know, you heard uh, Jamie Wheel and I talk a few episodes ago about the flow state. You know, there's a huge, you know, a lot of people go out and do drugs, alcohol, all kinds of things to make themselves feel better. It, it, exercise can do that. So it's not, be, but it isn't spoken about. It's kind of one of those hidden secrets in the fitness industry. That's why I wanted to have Katie on. That's why I think her book is so critically important. You know, it's interesting. We met maybe two years ago. She, you know, she's a writer, a reporter, and I'm a spokesperson for the American Council on Exercise. And so I get a lot, I do a lot of media reviews for them or media requests. And, and we met that way. And she told me about, you know, I looked her up. You know, sometimes I look up reporters if, if I haven't worked with them before, just to find out who I'm speaking with. And, you know, I saw that she wrote that book and, and it kind of filed that away, knowing that, that you know, I hadn't started the podcast yet. And I filed that away because I wanted to come back because I think that is such a serious issue. You know, I don't know if there are 12-step groups yet. And I'm serious about that. I don't know if there are 12-step groups yet for exercise addiction. It's not that exercise is bad. But if you put off over things and, and all you're doing is think about exercise and how much you're eating, I don't want to do that. And, and that can be dangerous. Like, we can go down that rabbit hole. I've seen people do that. I've done that you know, in the past. You know, as I shared, you know, I've been in, you know, been in 12 step. I've been in recovery for a while, you know, dealing with, uh, dealing with some issues and, and, you know, it's, it's funny, it, it works, you know, part of, part of the, you know, part of working the 12 step program is interacting with others and sharing your experience about how you feel about certain things. And it really, it can make a big difference. So coming together and finding out about other people who've been maybe dealing with the same things, you know, dealing with exercise addiction doesn't mean you don't exercise. You know, I've dealt with alcohol, you know. I don't drink, but that's my choice. <laughs> you know, that's my choice. I know that if I drink, who knows, I might wind up in Vegas with my pants around my head and, you know, $20,000 in debt. And uh, that hasn't happened to me, but uh, I'm going to add the famous saying of yet. <laughs> so I know that if I take another drink, hey, that could happen. So it's, it's better off I don't do that. But, but deal with something like exercise addiction doesn't mean that you don't exercise. It just means you have to be smart about it. And, and don't make it the priority. Don't make it the focal point in your life. I mean, I can't really give that advice. I don't, I don't know. You know, uh, it, everything's a little bit different for everybody. But what I wanted to do was start the conversation. I wanted to have the conversation. I wanted to have Katie on to, to raise the awareness of this issue. I've seen members of health clubs who have maybe been anorexic. You know, I've seen members of health clubs who maybe have, you know, a problem with exercise doing too much of it. You know, it's bad for your body. You know, if, if you've listened to my podcast before, if you've listened to me interview 
with other, you know, with, with fitness experts and, and other strength coaches, one of the common themes is recovery. Exercise is physical stress on the body. The way that the body adapts to exercise is you apply the stress of exercise cumulative over time. You, you apply progressively challenging exercise that's progressively challenging stress. Over the course of time, your body adapts to it and your body gets stronger. Your cardiorespiratory system gets more efficient at moving oxygen around the body. Muscles get more efficient at generating force to move resistance. But that's an appropriate level of stress. And what the top sports scientists know and what the top strength coaches know is it's just not, it's not about how hard you train, but it's how you recover, how you allow, allow your body to adapt to the stress you place on it. So but for somebody that, that becomes, that feels like they always have to have exercise, men deal with something called body dysmorphia, where they feel they're not big enough. You know, there's a huge issue of depression in the bodybuilding community. There are huge issues with depression and substance abuse in the bodybuilding community. And that stuff isn't really talked about, folks. Health clubs certainly aren't going to talk about it. They don't care. I hate to say that, but it's 100% true. The health clubs don't care. It's like a bar owner. A bar owner is not going to have an AA meeting you know, next door to the bar. It's just going to take customers away. Health clubs kind of look at this and say, oh, it's not really my deal. I'm going to take your money for the membership, and I don't really care. Come in, don't come in. It doesn't matter. But we need to be aware of the issue. We need to understand that this, that this is an issue. Katie decided to do something about it by writing a book to share her experience. She's now working on a master's in social work. And maybe there are others of you out there who have dealt with exercise addiction. You know, I'm not sure what the resources are. I'll take a little look around and maybe there is something and I'll have it down in the show notes for sure. But if you've dealt with it and you want to have a way to connect with Katie, if you want to, I would definitely recommend getting the book. And I would definitely recommend finding somebody to speak with, finding somebody to talk to. You know, there might be other underlying issues. You're using exercise to, you know, mask other things. You know, people become, you know, they, they work too much. Gamble, sex, you know, drugs, alcohol. You know, we like what makes us feel better. And there's a healthy amount of everything, right? There's a healthy amount of everything. Some people can drink healthily. I, know, I have a lot of friends who don't have a problem. You know, me, I lost my, you know, hey, I, I, I joke about it and, it's true. I, I've lost that privilege. <laughs> you know, I've done the long lost that privilege. I'm probably somebody who should stay away from alcohol. You know, certain friends of mine knew that 25 years ago, but hey, it takes, uh, it takes people to, a little bit of time to come to that realization. And if you're dealing with something like that, it doesn't mean you stay away from exercise, but it's reframing that relationship with it. Having a healthy relationship with exercise. Being in a position where you feel good about yourself, you feel comfortable about your body. You're not beating yourself up because you did this or I didn't do that. And it's probably, we're probably guilty of it, right? We're probably guilty. Fitness industry is probably guilty. Yo, come in and work out. You know, for those of you who had that extra cake over the weekend, yeah, we're going to work it off. And we, we food shame in class. We food shame in fitness classes. You know, if you didn't work out, we'll do it. You know, we do that. We have this, you know, this vernacular that we try to do that. And no wonder there's so many issues out there. So I'm not sure if I can do anything about that with this podcast, I don't know if, it, you know, hopefully this just, gave, just, just woke you up to, to realize that if you've dealt with this, you're not alone. There are other people out there like you. You can follow Katie on, on Twitter. I'll put her information down below. I'll put some uh, references down there if I can find them. But understand, if you're dealing with something like this, if you, if you feel that exercise is running your life, you're not alone. And there probably are ways to, to deal with that and address that. But this is an important issue, folks, and I wanted to try to bring it to the forefront or at least to try to raise awareness of it so that that, that way, if you, if you know of it, that we can at least try to do something about it. If you want to contact me, my email is pete at petemccallfitness.com. That's pete at petemccallfitness.com. I may take a little bit, but I will get back to you. I will respond. You can always follow me on Twitter, petemc underscore fitness. That's Pete MC underscore fitness on Twitter. And Instagram is Pete McCall underscore fitness. So if you're dealing with something like this, if you feel like you're addicted, understand you're not alone. And there are things out there that can help you. Thanks for stopping by. And I look forward to having you join me for future episodes of All About Fitness.